Okay, don't move. First time I saw a picture develop in the darkroom, I was just amazed. I remember pointing the camera and having him beam this just the huge smile at me. And I think I was hooked. I think the voices that these pictures give them is that we have a life worth living. That was a huge, I think, goal of this project. I am an official snowflakeologist. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, this one's, this one's got color in it. It's an opportunity to bond with my creator and also to see the world in a way that um, few people take the time to notice. For me, it's been really good to look beyond this planet, beyond this solar system. When I go to a dark sky and I look up and I see these stars, these brighter stars, it's like I'm looking at something that is part of the design of our existence. It's one thing to see a picture that somebody else takes, but it's another thing to see it for yourself. My purpose here is to tell stories. My purpose here is to lift up narratives of this community. It is to embrace and disrupt harmful stereotypes. I moved here six years ago and I just saw something really unique about Denver's black community. First, there wasn't many of us, right? Um, but I also noticed um, a lot of people just something unique and powerful and that thing was people being themselves. And I really wanted to capture that and understand what, what I was seeing, what I was experiencing, um, and document this beautiful community that I had discovered here. Black in Denver is an art-based research project. I've called it ethnography. I've called it a portrait and interview series. I've even called it an ode to a community of people. Um, but the work takes an takes a look at identity. It investigates identity and what it means to be you and what makes you you and how you make up a collective. Um, it's all about how we're interconnected to one another. Um, it takes a look at a community using the self. So I put myself in the community to understand what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing. So it's a lot of listening um, to understand. Um, I hold space for my participants to share who they are um, in a very safe space, um, a way for them to open up and be vulnerable and be authentic. So yeah, Black in Denver is, you know, a research project. It's a portrait and interview series. It's, um, it's visual art. It's a number of things. To be Esther means to laugh a lot, to walk into a room and try to bring some positive light into the room. A part of my process is conversation. We sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one intimate conversation before we even take the photo. Um, so that's what allows me to really connect with them through photography. Um, I get them to open up, we get comfortable. I take a photo and I take a lot of photos actually. And then I look for their eyes. And that's what I really want my photos to do is I want them to see you and I want you to see them. When you gaze up at the universe, you're witnessing your connection to greatness. And I think the majority of, of the population of this planet feels like maybe we don't belong, we don't fit in. But when you start looking at pictures of space, you start realizing how important your place is here and how unique it is. What, a, what an amazing opportunity to not only just be here in this life, in this moment, on this planet, but to look far beyond our own galaxy and see this whole universe that it really does, it's a, it's a part of us all and we're all a part of it. If that belongs there, then you belong right where you are. It's just a little bit on the heavy side. <laughs> I'm getting this. So this is my backyard in Colorado Springs. Um, we do a lot of photography from here, a lot of testing if we get new equipment from here. There's a lot that goes into this, as you'll see. And all of this takes definitely some time and patience. My name is Kara Marcus. I am a deep space astrophotographer, I will say hobby enthusiast, and I live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. My 
brother had a telescope. He got his first one when he was in his 20s. And he comes over and he has a big eight inch telescope and he had eyepieces. He aimed at Saturn. And I looked at it and I could see the rings just perfectly. It's one thing to see a picture that somebody else takes, but it's another thing to see it for yourself. So I think that was the seed. So this is my camera. And then this is my reducer flattener. And then I will unscrew this. And this baby goes right here. Astrophotography is a very unique field of photography. You can go out in the summer and set up a tripod and a camera and a wide angle lens and do a long exposure and get to see the stars in the Milky Way and the core and some beautiful details of the sky. The biggest difference between that and deep space astrophotography is with deep space astrophotography, you're looking way closer in on a target. You're zooming in, you're honing in on one thing. This button up here has my sensor information, and so it gives me an idea of what my frame will be when I'm on a target. So this red outline of a box around the heart nebula is roughly my framing. I like to stay on my targets as long as I can. I would say the longest I've shot Andromeda was six hours, maybe seven, from here. You take a series of long exposures and then you do some calibrated frames and you do a little bit of magic and then you have softwares that will stack your images for you. So one 600 second image stretched, the stack that includes the flats, the darks, dark flats, all of it. And then this is my final processing on it. And this, I, I, with the color here, all I had to do was boost the saturation a little bit. I, I will admit, when we got started doing this, I had no idea the depth that was going to be involved. This is where I'm going to give a bunch of credit to my husband. He has been the, the biggest teacher for me with this. And we don't have kids. This is kind of our baby. So this is one of our images. I say ours. My husband actually got this one with the 10-inch telescope. And this is the Whirlpool Galaxy. But I processed it. So it's a cool combination there. So this is the Whirlpool Galaxy. This is one of the most popular galaxies for, for astrophotographers to shoot. It's kind of iconic. For me, it's been really good to look beyond this planet, beyond this solar system, kind of just beyond this reality and see what's happening further away. I have bipolar disorder. I was diagnosed seven years ago. It's been rough. <laughs> It has really saved my mind. I, I feel like I have a purpose and meaning when I do this, and that's why I keep doing it. It's my artistic outlet, you know, and I don't get to do it every day. You know, if you're a painter, you can paint every day. This, not so much. If the moon is big, if it's cloudy, there's so many obstacles, but it's, it's worth it. If I can impact one person in this world to share a photo that makes them think, oh my gosh, what a unique, place I'm in. I think that it is a really good reminder of the bigger picture here. So when I go to a dark sky and I look up and I see these things, these stars, these brighter stars, it's like I'm looking at something that is part of the design of our existence. And that's just humbling, very, very humbling. And it's a privilege to be able to do it. This is my picture wall. These are some of my most early portraits. Uh, in fact, this young man right here, he was one of my very first pictures. And I remember pointing the camera and having him beam this just the huge smile at me. And I think I was hooked. I think that's all it took. I was hooked at that point. My name is Andy Lurie, and I'm the creator of the American Quilt Project. The American Quilt Project is basically a metaphorical quilt of humanity. It's uh, essentially a lot of portrait photographs of all kinds of people who I've come across the path of, and it's all together on Instagram. I began the project about five, six years ago. I have uh, over 5,000 portraits at this point. About 10 years ago, I went through a very, very dark phase um, and I uh, attempted suicide uh, twice seriously. I ended up waking up in the hospital 
which was felt like some kind of a miracle to me that I was still alive. I decided I needed something to do. I needed a purpose. I wanted to do something that showed love and connection. I think I'm gonna wear a hat. Okay, get my stuff. In. I'm looking for all kinds of people, actually. That's a good question because my aim from the very beginning was to, to be very diverse. It's not terribly crowded here today, but there's some people walking around. I just approach people who are in the right place at the right time, and I ask if I can take their picture. And I do this project on Instagram. It's called the American Quilt Project. And it's surprising how many people say, sure. Two, three. Thank you so much. Sure. There we go, one, two, three. Of course, it's so big right now, it would take you all day to go from the top to the bottom of my Instagram page. I want people to feel uplifted, like they belong to this human race as well. I hope the pictures emanate a kind of a, a love, really, and, and that people feel connected to that. Okay, don't move. Okay, good. Now you can move. Oh, the first time I saw a picture develop in the darkroom, I was just amazed. Uh, and then the first tintype I ever saw come out in the fixer, it was that same thing again from, from back my first year in college. <laughs> so it was exactly the same. Um, so, yeah, it's fun. I like it. I'm sorry, I love it. <laughs> I'm Vanessa Ford. I'm a tintype photographer, and I was recently in Palisade, Colorado, uh, doing a tintype for a young couple and their truck. Tintypes were invented by Frederick Scott Archer in 1851. Um, he took collodion, which was invented in 1846 uh, for medical purposes, and used that to um, make a sensitive plate to be able to catch images. They were using the tintype process through the Civil War um, till about the early 1900s. I was working in photo labs when digital started. Um, I avoided going to digital for as long as I could, but then I was able to get jobs doing sport photography and I made money that way. So I did go to digital, but it, it really just, uh, kind of killed the magic. The first thing I do is uh, pour the collodion on the plate. Kind of want it to set up like a little gel first. Next, I put the plate in the silver nitrate bath to make it light sensitive. Next, I put the plate in a light tight plate holder. <laughs> if I'm photographing people, I do a quick uh, check of the focus on the camera and then I load the plate holder. Okay, ready? Don't move. Next, I remove the dark slide and the plate is ready for the exposure. I tell everyone to be super still and then I remove the lens cap for the exposure. Put the lens cap back on, you may. take it back to the dark box. So with this process, there's so many different variables that come into play that if you're expecting perfect, um, you might have to change what your definition of perfect is. You can't control everything. The light's gonna change in that four minutes that it's in the silver bath. You can't use a light meter. 
it's not like film photography at all. It's just its own cool thing. It's more hands-on even than just film and, and black and white photography and printing. Um, oh. And that's why I like it. That's awesome. It's hard to read on these cloudy days. <laughs> My computer uh, metering system in my brain works better on sunny days. <laughs> but the next one, it's gonna be it. It's the last one. <laughs> Third time's a charm. So my favorite tintype so far, um, I did earlier on when I was first starting out, and uh, it's of my wife, Megan, holding a chicken. So she's holding the chicken, and the body of the chicken is still, but the head is moving back and forth. Um, so it looks like the chicken is headless, which is kind of funny because we live in Fruto, which is known for Mike the Headless Chicken. So I like to, to say that it's one of his cousins. Right now I'm heating the plate to burn off any excess moisture that might be on it before I pour the varnish on. Then I pour the varnish on. And the varnish prevents it from tarnishing. Since there's real silver in the plate, it will tarnish over time. You kind of bake the varnish onto the plate. With digital, you always know what you're gonna get. With tintype, you never know what you're gonna get, and that's the magic. This is Shirley. She actually just turned 90 um, a couple days ago, and she lives in an, a retirement community in Denver. And her quote um, says, I, I came out at 81, meaning I started openly talking about my relationship of 38 years. But to really begin to realize what that would feel like to actually hide your relationship for 80 years. I think the voices that these pictures give them is that we have a life worth living. Losing the person behind the data and behind the research and I really wanted to bring the person back in so people in the community could see how research and statistics affect people and affect their lives and so that was really what eye to eye grew out of. We know that there are significant disparities that the, that the older LGBT community face, like 56% report experiencing some form of discrimination from a healthcare provider. And for those who are trans or gender non-conforming, it goes up to 70%. Trying to hide is a detriment. It doles every mental and spiritual tool needed to navigate through all other difficulties in life. We also know that 75% of older LGBT people go back into the closet when they enter assisted living or senior living communities. This sense of having to come out over and over to, um, to everyone and how much this matters in healthcare when um, you are sick, scared, and tired. And the burden is on them to have to be the ones to, to come out and be able to be who they are and talk about who matters most to them. They haven't wanted to remain silent, but these photos I think are, are a way of giving them an even louder voice. And I think having them together is sort of bringing them into a sense of a community is also a voice of, of strength. I do have concerns about hospice. I'm worried things will be outside my control. I still have to shave. I don't wanna have hair on my face when I die. And that was her biggest fear is that if she were to enroll in hospice and a nurse didn't ask, you know, what were her biggest fears or gave her space for her to actually express that she does still need to shave. And her biggest fear was that she didn't want to die as a man uh, with a man's name and with hair on her face. The exhibit is called Eye to Eye, Portraits of Pride, Strength, and Bravery. And it consists of older LGBTQ women who live in Colorado. I never felt I had to explain myself or make an announcement about being queer. We are all just people. We are all humans. The photos are needed because I think it helps people see that these are just people like them. Um, and in you, just because someone loves love someone different than you are, this is, these are people. 
These are very good people who want the same things as, as you want, as, as other people want. They want to love, they want to be loved, they want to have careers, they want to have families, they want to have faith, they want to travel, they want to do all these things. And why I think we continue to make it so difficult for people to be able to be who they are um, is, is not right. And I think my hope is that when they see these pictures, they realize it's just, it's their friends, it's their family members, it's their colleagues, it's um, their neighbors, and it shouldn't continue to be so difficult to be able to be who you are. There are two main reasons. One is to really humanize the, the data, to be able to really see the individual behind these statistics. And a second piece of, of it is really to, to help destigmatize the LGBT community in general. I think um, it is a community that has a bunch of, of stigma, a bunch of fear around it. And that was a huge, I think, goal of this project is to actually see these women, see their faces and um, realize they're not, they're not that scary and in hopes of really helping people just connect human to human, person to person. My goal really with this exhibit is to change a few people who then change a few more, who then change a few more. And a lot of people in general don't have a very good idea of just what these folks went through, just how difficult it was to be able to be who they were, how so many of them did lose jobs, they did lose careers, they did lose family, they did lose housing, they did lose friends, just because of, of, of who they were. I'm sure my neighbors sit there and wonder, you know, why I sit out here holding a black sock in the air. So the COVID pandemic has been very, very personal to me. Um, my colleagues and I, um, and particularly my nursing colleagues, have been uh, right up in it uh, from the get-go. So it's been a very high-stress time um, taking care of patients with COVID. You know, it, it is admittedly a little odd. I'm what's called a hospitalist. So I take care of adults who are too sick to go home from the emergency department. When you think about the beauty of what nature has in store, that all this is molecules of water crystallizing at 107.9 degree angles. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Colorado Hospital. You know, one of the things that we talk about in the medical profession is resilience. And um, resilience is really hard to maintain when you think about, you know, for two years, everyone's holding their breath, waiting for something to end. And the thing is, you gotta breathe. You gotta find a way to take a breath and enjoy life. I have to catch the flakes right before they fall because you, you can't pick them up once they hit the ground. So notice I'm not holding the sock like this, I'm holding it like vertically because the snowflakes that are fun to photograph actually will cling as they fall down the side of the, the, uh, the uh, sock. I am an official snowflakeologist. <laughs> A lot of people ask, you know, is it really true that there are no two snowflakes alike? And that's true. If you look at snowflakes really closely, you'll see that they're almost never symmetric up close. Just the span of one tiny snowflake encounters different microclimates, which change how it crystallizes. So it, it, it's remarkable. Some of the snowflakes are just so stunningly beautiful. And to realize that here I am standing in a deck that's covered in trillions of them, <laughs> it's just crazy. Here I am honing in on just one. Right there, there's a snowflake. Oh man, I wish it could focus up closer, but if I change the angle on it, it gets more or less reflective. Oh, I wish I could get it just right. So the key uh, to good snowflake photos, well first you have to have good snow, <laughs> and it has to be really cold, and you have to be outside. The hazard is I could squish one of the models. And I, I strictly practice catch and release, um, I, I, you know, I freshly source all my snowflakes, but I make sure that they come back to a good home. <laughs> <laughs> the other part that's really key in, in snowflake photos is the lighting. Just a hair's breadth of tilt in my camera can completely change whether you see a beautiful snowflake or you don't. Oh, it's really pretty too. You know, it's, what's fun about snowflake photography is it's something you do in the field. Um, so my studio is really complex. It's a table, the sock, a light, and my camera. <laughs> That's it. But I do welcome all snowflakes of all different shapes and sizes to come visit. And I'm always happy when they do. Some of those centers are incredible. They look like etched glass. So I find a lot of solace, uh, first and foremost, in my family, who are kind of hysterical. Um, 
they're they're a great support system. But I also find it in photography. Oh yeah. Oh, this one's this one's got color in it. It sounds crazy that you know snowflakes of all things could be very therapeutic, but. It's an opportunity to bond with my creator and also to see the world in a way that um, few people take the time to notice. So snowflakes can do, oh my goodness, yes. Yeah, it's got some broken arms, but it, it can be salvaged. But I'll show you this, this is pretty crazy. So you wouldn't think that snow has color to it. Um, you just think it's with it white. But it turns out that as the snowflake forms, it can create a layer that is, is two different densities in the center. And that acts a lot like gasoline on water and will refract those colors. These are leftover bits of dust in the atmosphere. But it's very, very difficult to explain how much beauty is on each of these snowflakes. So this is a classic dendritic snowflake. A rainbow coloring appearing in the middle of a snowflake and this is this very rare you have to have very specific conditions for this to sort of set up we were lucky today we caught a snowflake that had that and I get to share that with somebody else so if I can be of service to somebody else that takes me out of myself and I think these snowflakes add to this wonderment you know of nature and and possibility and beauty um, so like a lot of things in life you could look at this as oh my gosh this is the worst traffic that we've encountered or you could look at it like Every single one of those flakes that's falling right now has a story to tell, and they're pretty magnificent.